Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dubcast with Dubside, the podcast where we talk about the art of Greenland-style kayaking. I'm Andrew Lazaga, and I'll be your host for this special episode. Today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Molten Avery, an internationally recognized authority on cold water safety. Molten is the founder and director of the National Center for Cold Water Safety and has been a key figure in promoting cold water safety for over 40 years. He has developed and taught courses on wilderness survival and has authored numerous articles on the subject of heat and cold stress. Molten's work has been featured nationally in hundreds of newspaper articles, radio programs, and television shows. He was a founding member of the American Canoe Association's National Coastal Kayak Committee and contributed to the development of the ACA's Coastal Kayaking Program. Molten also happens to be a Greenland-style enthusiast and a good friend of Dubside. Welcome, Molten, and thanks so much for agreeing to be on the Dubcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, to speaking with you about all those things you said. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so to start off with, could you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you became an expert in the field of wilderness survival and heat and cold stress? Well, I uh, I was a city boy, and I really didn't know much of anything about how to get along in the outdoors. And when I started college, uh, my mom had died, and uh, that kind of orphaned my brother and sister and I. And I, I would say you could you could characterize me as a guy who had a chip on his shoulder the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> and as it turned out, the place that I found uh, some respite uh, from, you know, that anger and that that sadness was in the outdoors. And I just had the good fortune of running into a book by an Englishman by the name of Colin Fletcher. And he wrote this book called The Complete Walker. And his whole idea was he was uh, he was pushing backpacking. So the idea was you could carry your house on your back. And I thought, well, this is just marvelous. I was hooked. But you know, <laughs> uh, there's a difference between book learning and practical experience. You know, they they have a nice uh, a nice relationship. But somehow in his book, I missed the idea of rain gear. And I was ambitious, so I'd, I'd gone out to Sears and I, I picked up a backpack and a line of stuff that they had it carried Edmund Hillary's name, you know, the guy mm. from Everest. And so they were like, Hillary backpack, Hillary sleeping bag. It was awful gear, <laughs> it <was> awful <laughs> gear. But it got me started. But I was I was ambitious, um, a little too ambitious, and I picked for my first hike the Appalachian Trail along the crest of the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. And that runs around 6,000 feet. And, and the part that I missed was that above 4,500 feet in the Smokies, it's a temperate rainforest. It gets almost as much rain as the Pacific Northwest. And so predictably, you know, I got a little bit above 4,000 feet and it started raining. And I didn't have any rain gear. Oh, wow. But one of the things that you couldn't miss with Colin Fletcher's book was a tarp because it was on the front page of the book and he had all his gear laid out on it. So I had gotten a tarp. I set it up over the trail because what else could I do? And that was my baptism in the wilderness in the sense that I realized there was a lot more to it, and a lot I didn't understand, and also that you could really get into trouble because I spent the entire night sitting on top of my my pack and there's a little stream running down the trail and I had my damp sleeping bag wrapped around my shoulders and the wind was howling and the tarp was flapping and my teeth were chattering. That was a long, long night. And when the sun finally rose in the morning, you know, this pale light kind of comes into the the forest, and this is a stunningly beautiful area, and the mist is kind of rolling through, and I packed up my stuff, and I put my tail firmly between my legs, and I hauled ass down off that mountain as fast as I could, mm -hmm. and that was my first trip, and 
a little bit later, I ran into a book by a fellow who was uh, a physician, Ted Lathrop, and he was with this organization called the Mazamas, which is kind of the counterpart of the Mountaineers in, uh, in Washington State. Well, the Mazamas are in Oregon, and he'd written this little booklet, Hypothermia, Killer of the Unprepared. Hmm. And, of course, with this teeth-chattering <laughs> episode fresh in my, in my memory, you know, there was his book, and every other page of it was a horror story. I mean, there was the, you know, physiology of hypothermia and heat production, heat loss, heat conservation, all that. But then, boom, here was one case. And then a little more information, boom, here was another case. And it made this tremendous impression on me. And I thought, hypothermia, because I'd never heard of it. There was nothing about it in Fletcher's book. And so I kind of got on a little bit of a mission to spread the word. You know, you picture me wrapping myself in Lathrop's book, and I was going to go out, and I became a hypothermia prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the beginning. And and it's it's one thing, I think, to read a book like that and then try to spread the word there. But I was very curious about the whole subject. And so I uh, started, I guess in college, one of the things I learned is you, you better do your homework. If you're going to write a paper, you know, it better be well-researched. And there's a superficial level of understanding, and then there's a deeper level of understanding. And so I read every single article that I could get my hands on from scientific and medical literature. Hmm. So that continued while I was in college. I did a lot more backpacking. and I got out of college. I was, I was actually had become fairly skilled at it and certainly had a very deep understanding of hypothermia, and I felt like I was prepared to to share that knowledge on a, on a larger basis. And I had a mentor, a woman by the name of Louise Chatfield, who was a conservationist, and she introduced me to conservation. And she also said, why don't you start a school where you can teach people how to travel in the wilderness? There were two gifts she gave me. One of them was that she called education the gift of knowledge. And that really resonated me. And the other one was her firm belief that unless we could get more people traveling through the wilderness and experiencing the wilderness, we couldn't expect them to strongly support conservation because they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have a stake in the game, not, not an emotional stake the way they would if they'd gone out and had these wilderness experiences. And I thought, well, based on my first experience, there were a couple of things I wanted to bring to the game. And, and the gift of knowledge, thinking about that, I thought, what are the two things that I really want my students to be able to do? And it was no matter what the terrain, no matter what Mother Nature threw at them, I wanted them to be able to travel through the wilderness safely and comfortably. Hmm. And those two things, um, you know, by their very nature, involve understanding things like hypothermia and how to keep warm and freezing weather and so forth. So that was kind of the genesis of it. So I ran the wilderness school for six years, and, uh, and it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. We had a great group of people. It was a nonprofit. Everybody was a volunteer. This was right out of college or what did you, yeah, yeah. What did you study in college? <laughs> well, you know, it was the, uh, it was the late sixties, early seventies and yeah. the Vietnam war was going along and, you know, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with society that I thought needed to be addressed. So I majored in political science. Okay. A friend of mine, um, says that, you know, that's, that is not exactly the most lucrative degree <laughs> that one could obtain. And so we refer to ourselves as political scientists. We put a P in front of the science, oh, <laughs> an audible P, scientists. We're scientists to distinguish, you know, ourselves really from a, a, a deep respect that we have for for actual science. Okay, yeah. But the political science actually, uh, you know, it did come in handy in terms of conservation. 
that came in handy in terms of pushing for environmentally uh, good legislation. And it was somewhat helpful after the wilderness school when I went to Washington, D.C. and started this other nonprofit devoted to uh, addressing heat wave mortality in the United States. So I guess the lesson there is that, you know, you're going to make of it what you what you will. And mm-hmm. even though we joke about it, it did come in pretty handy <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> so what was the wilderness school like? Well, it was, um, as it turns out, there are philosophies, two philosophies that govern wilderness education. And one of them is exemplified by Outward Bound. And that is a philosophy, it's called experiential stress challenge. So the idea is you you might not know all that much about it, but we're going to take you out into the wilderness. And the wilderness is going to serve as a crucible where you're going to learn that you have... uh, oh, let's say greater mental and physical resources than you thought possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so part of that is a three-day solo experience and so forth. So I don't, I don't discount that as a, uh, as a way to affect change in an individual, but I don't think that it gives you the foundation for a lifetime of going out into the wilderness and appreciating the wilderness for what it is. It's not just a crucible where you're going to be tested. It's a, uh, you know, it's something far more deep, far more primal. And I think it speaks to something very primal in anyone who gives it a chance. And that's because this urban environment that we live in, this civilization is a relative newcomer on the stage. Mm-hmm. Up until what, maybe fifteen thousand years ago, everybody was a hunter gatherer, mm-hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden, here comes agriculture and so forth. And uh, so, I think the experiential stress challenge did not impress me. It wasn't something I was interested in. The other model I thought was the National Outdoor Leadership School, which had been started by Paul Petzold. And Petzold was basically he was kind of a a crusty guy who really felt that you needed to learn some techniques in order to go out there and have this wilderness experience and not get yourself killed. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, given my first backpacking experience, you know, that kind of resonated deeply with me. And so this was going to be a school where you would learn and not just to respect for the wilderness, but, but also the techniques to travel again, safely and comfortably through that environment. So that was the model that I wanted. And so all of the, as it turns out, most of these classes were taught through a local community college. They were taught at our school, but we had this handshake arrangement with a local community college where they would help to fund them. And we wound up, oh gosh, with maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 different courses over time. And so we'd have like wilderness travel techniques, one, two, three, you know, winter, wilderness travel, wilderness emergencies classes. It's kind of like a all-you-can-eat buffet, except you, you didn't have to have every every single piece if you wanted to take the wilderness travel techniques. One, that was enough for you, fine. If you wanted to go deeper, you could certainly do that. And my instructors came from my students. So that was kind of how we built, you know, built the house, if you will. You know, they'd start out and, and they'd fall in love with it and they'd learn more and more. And eventually, you know, they'd want to share that knowledge too. And so that's how we did it. But it was, uh, it was, it was a real exciting time. I always think back on it fondly. Every once in a while, I'll hear from a student who gets in touch with me just sort of out of the blue because they stumble across me on Facebook and they'll say, you know, something really sweet about how much the knowledge meant to them and you know how they went on to have these wonderful experiences in the outdoors and Mm -hmm. so forth and and that makes me feel good because uh you know i feel like i'm carrying a torch louise chatfield passed to me and and that that then you know in turn i'm teaching other people and and they're passing that knowledge along and I, i feel the same way about the cold water center you know i'm just one guy and 
you know, there's a real limit to what any one person can accomplish by themselves. And so we have people all over the country that are enthusiastically sharing that message. So I feel like it has a, a longevity and that that's the reason that we've had so much success in changing the paddling communities thinking over the years about the danger of cold water. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just me, you know, I'm, I'm just one guy, but it's all these other people who believe in it and who are sharing the gift of knowledge. And so that's a good feeling. I mean, I feel, you know, that gives my life meaning and it's also a community of people. And I think if you've got community and meaning in your life, you could do a lot worse <laughs> than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so how did you get involved in sea kayaking? Well, you know, I was a canoe guy. Okay. And uh, I'd uh, been certified as a flat water canoe instructor and then a white water canoe instructor. Flat water through the American Red Cross because that's that's the outfit that was doing that back in the day. And But white water was the American Canoe Association. And I got my white water certification at Natahale Outdoor Center in, right in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, actually in Natahale Mountains, but they're right next door. So I, you know, I'd been teaching canoeing and really loved canoes and I got up to Washington DC in 1984 rolls around and I see a picture of a valley Nord cap sea kayak ah. and these were the expedition boats yeah. back in the day and they were extraordinary boats they had so many innovations and you know it was not uncommon to see a picture of a couple of them on a beach you know some couple guys you know, taking this expedition so the first ones I saw, I thought, oh, my God, what a beautiful, absolutely stunning looking kayak. There was one guy, Ken Fink, who was importing them. He lived up in Maine. He's an oceanographer. So on one of my trips out of the country, I flew in to uh, see him, spent the night at his house, tried out the boats and ordered one. And I don't know if this is true now, but in those days, you could, if you custom ordered the boat, they would fit the forward bulkhead to your leg length. Oh, wow. So that was nice. So that was the start. That was 1984. And Ken had sold another Nord Cap to a fellow who lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And he uh, gave me the guy's name. And so we, we hooked up. And that was Brian Price. And we became kayak partners. And so that was pretty much how I got started in sea kayaking. One of the interesting things is that back in the day, we were introduced to the Greenlandic tradition by John Heath. Okay. Who at that time was running around. He had a little dog and pony show that was fascinating. And he was like the Johnny Appleseed (laughs) of Greenland kayaking. And he'd just make the rounds. And, you know, we caught one of his lectures and it's like, oh my God, I had no idea. Huh. This and was so, through the ACA? No, not no? at all. Oh, okay. ACA is completely oblivious oh. to Greenland kayaking. They just, pff, no, they didn't know anything about it. No, this was just happened to be, you know, the paddling community. Somebody says, hey, this guy's going to give a talk. And so Brian and I said, oh, wow, well, yeah, let's go check it out. And he just blew the socks right off our feet. It was absolutely, you know, just to, it, it informed our feeling about kayaking. It gave, it placed these kayaks in this historical context. And, you know, if you were even paying a little bit of attention, you couldn't help but feel a gratitude, a gratitude towards and an admiration for the Inuit who had designed these kayaks. And, you know, the Nord Cap is not exactly what you'd call a Greenland boat. It approximates to a certain degree, you know. It kind of channels the love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we became very, very interested in this whole Greenlandic thing. Meanwhile, we're paddling with 90-degree feather Euro blades. Yeah. <laughs> but we learned a low-angle Greenlandic stroke from people like John Heath and others, you know. So uh-huh. it, it's, it was funny. I developed this, this lovely low-angle Greenlandic stroke uh, with a 90-degree feather euro, which 
maybe we'll get back to later. But we were so impressed with this that we we were members of this uh, club called the Washington Canoe Club in uh, D.C. And that's where we we kept our kayaks at their boathouse. And when we heard uh, that there was a club in Greenland and, you know, all this stuff was going on in Greenland, we thought, well, what could we do to show our respect for that? You know, how could we kind of maybe reach out a hand of friendship to the, the Greenlandic paddlers in Greenland? Mm-hmm. And so we enlisted John Heath's help with that, and we contacted the Danish embassy because, you know, it's like that was Greenland. <laughs> You couldn't pick up the phone and call. I mean, who the hell knew anything about it? But John did. And so we sent a letter off to the club in Greenland, and we proposed that we would have uh, a sister. We would be a sister club. Oh, okay. That never went anywhere formally. But what did happen that was kind of interesting was they needed some money to send a couple of people from Greenland to Alaska where there was some kind of a, you know, there was a conference that was going on on Aleut boats or something. I don't remember exactly, but we were able to raise money to help send two of their folks to Alaska. And, you know, that was uh, kind of about as far as it went. I mean, we were kind of I was get, going through some changes in my life, and I was married. My first daughter was born, and Brian moved to Colorado, and so I was powering back a little bit on the kayaking. There was this sense, you know, of excitement uh, in in that period because sea kayaking was a relatively new sport in the states. And then here was John Heath, and and and. I have to say that my knowledge of the Inuit, I think about, it makes me happy. It makes me happy to have met uh, people like John Peterson at Delmarva because it, it, it gives every stroke I take a, a richer meaning because I'm so, I'm mindful of that tradition. And I think we owe the Inuit a tremendous uh, sense of gratitude. Now, when you when you met uh, John Heath, was he touring with Maligiak? No, I, I didn't. I, I didn't meet Maligiak until much later. Okay. I met Maligiak for the first time at the um, Chesapeake Paddlers Association. Uh, there's a gathering they have there called Sea Kayak 102, and Dubside was Dubside frequents that, and he and Maligiak were there, and that was the first time in my recollection that I met Dubside or Maligiak. And boy, <laughs> synchronized rolling by those two! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had this love of the Greenland heritage, but. It was quite a while before I was able to divest myself of the 90 degree feather euro. Mm -hmm. One of the spurs there was I'd started going back to Delmarva. I was at the first uh, three Delmarva things, and then I kind of didn't go for a long time, raising a family and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so when I went back, there I was with my old Nord cap, and you know, I knew some of the old hands. Uh, They were very, very gracious and welcoming. But there I was with a 90 degree feather euro. And I felt in retrospect, you know, that was a little cheeky of me. And it's very nice that they were so gracious (laughs) (laughs) about it. (laughs) And so then I I, I on this paddle and I developed this tendonitis like after about three hours in my left hand. I had to stop. Oh, wow. And, you know, there's this little voice saying, you should be using a different paddle. Did anybody come up to you and uh, offer you a Greenland paddle? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially in the race. Okay. Yeah. They have the race, you know, with the, you got to go around this thing and it's followed by the, you know, person on the back of the kayak, you know, thing. That's the third stage. This is the second stage. So, oh, yeah, they were so gracious. Now, here's a, I'm like, no way in hell. <laughs> I don't know how to use that thing. This is a race. Are you kidding me? <laughs> And they were so sweet about it, really, really sweet about it. 
<laughs> but yes, many people offered me and many people, uh, you know, suggested that perhaps I'd like to try a Greenland paddle. And so within a year, uh, I'd attended a workshop uh, and I'm not very good with visualizing geometric stuff and making the paddle appear out of a piece of wood. I mean, that's sculpture. My mind doesn't work very well like that, but somebody was at my elbow and helped me carve my first Greenland paddle. And I have never looked back. You know, I mean, we affectionately call them sticks, but this is, if you want to get right down to it, this is a hydrodynamically very sophisticated piece of equipment. And it's beautiful. And I think it's funny that when Western culture meets uh, native technology, they always think that they can improve on the game. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> you know, they can do it. Oh, no, no, we've got this better paddle and so forth and so on. And so I, I, I can give you a whole 20 minutes on why the 90 degree feather euro was <laughs> just something I would not recommend to any beginning paddler. And yet the stick is, uh, the Greenland paddle is just, it's a beautiful thing. And a lot of people used to say, oh, well, it's fine for touring, but, you know, I wouldn't want to take it in, you know, yeah. surf or whatever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody comes out and they're just surfing with it like a champ. And it's like, well, mm. <laughs> or it's, it's good for rolling, but, um, oh, no, yes. Do those yes, tricks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's good for, but it's good for, but. But, you know, I, I don't fault anyone for, for using a euro or whatever, but I do think that uh, I'm 74 now, and I've never had a single problem with my wrists or shoulders or anything else mm -hmm. uh, since I started using the, uh, the Greenland paddle. And I think it is extraordinary for extended paddle techniques. I mean, so much, so much better than the euro for that kind of thing. So. What was your experience um, learning to roll with it, and um, how good were you at rolling with a Euroblade? I was fine, fine rolling with it. The Euroblade, uh, though, I think, just my own personal opinion, but I think it, it allows you to be a little sloppier because it has that big spoon. And and I, you know, I'm not I'm not a good, I'm not really a good roller. I do, I teach a lot of stuff in kayaking. Rolling is not something that I teach. And it's because I don't feel that I'm good enough or experienced enough. A good rolling coach, I mean, they are, they're marvelous. They have so much experience and they can spot and they have so many different ways of, of communicating the information to see what, you know, what's going to resonate with you. And I don't have that. It's not a skill set I have, mm -hmm. but I do love uh, teaching sculling. <laughs> And I'm kind of along with Warren Williamson. I think sculling is a marvelous, absolutely marvelous skill. And I think it is uh, so much easier with the Greenland paddle. So my wife's role is actually prettier than mine because she learned how to do it right the first time. So she has a beautiful layback role. You must have learned rolling for whitewater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And bad habits. And I think probably for with rolling, you know, it's, uh, if you don't come out of your boat, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's the good thing. But you have to admire the grace that people like Dubside or Helen Wilson or, or any of these other top notch coaches bring, you know, to them. and they do so many different roles and it's a beautiful thing to see. I mean, that's what really attracted me to Greenland style was the rolling demo. Chris Cunningham's rolling demo at the West Coast Sea Cock Symposium. Well, I, I think it's uh, no matter what kind of, uh, of a role, I think if you do a couple of them in succession, people on shore, they feel this spontaneous need to break into applause <laughs> because it is, it is the ultimate magic trick. <laughs> so sometimes they, they call can't help them. <laughs> they, oh, they can't help themselves. They're like, oh my God, oh my God. And then whoop, you're back up and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> so I just, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. And, you know, I, I, there are people who will try to make arguments for why the role isn't necessary. Really? On and on. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. You run into that every, every now and then. There are always people who can't roll or they've had trouble 
with a role. And, you know, a number of them are instructors. When we started that ACA program, there was one certification. And I was sea kayaking instructor. There are a whole bunch of them now. All different levels, this, that, and the other. So, so damn complicated, you can hardly figure it out. But then there was one. And if you couldn't roll, you weren't going to get your ticket stamped. Period. And it was our feeling that you're a kayaker. If you can't roll, what kind of street cred are you going to have with your students? You know, when we were, when I started in 84, especially in the Nordcat, because compared to a canoe, that thing is pretty twitchy. Compared to um, racing, sit on top, it's, it's not twitchy at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was twitchy enough for me that I really was motivated to learn how to roll. It was not easy in those days because you had to find somebody that would teach you. And there, there were no formal instruction programs. So everything was passed in a mentorship way or by doing it. Now it's, it's real different, but we were motivated to do it. And I think anyone that, that doesn't see the, what a marvelous thing it is, if you can roll, uh, you have no reservation about practicing bracing, for example. None at all. You know, you you miss a stroke or catch your paddle or something, over you go, and then right back up you come. And it's nothing. It's no big deal. It's not, oh, we got to do a rescue now. No. Yeah, it, it opens up so much for you in terms of going yeah. out to more challenging conditions and currents and um, oh, yeah. tidal races and surf. Yeah. So back in the 80s, when you were working with the American Canoe Association, yeah. What was known about how people died while sea kayaking? And how did that thinking evolve over the years? Well, the fatalities that we, we usually ran into were associated with, uh, with cold water. That had been true for quite some time. But it wasn't, you know, the, you didn't have the Internet. And you had, like, on the East Coast, there was a, a newsletter called Anorak, which was the Association of North Atlantic Kayakers, and, and that was pretty much it. You know, and then there was Hutchison had written a book, and Dowd had written a book. Dowd was, he, he never was able to reconcile himself with the wisdom of wearing a wetsuit or dry suit. Just never could, you know. And, and Hutchison, he didn't like them because they were, you know, they were cumbersome. Mm -hmm. But Hutchison was a was a, a very accomplished paddler. He's going to roll up. In John Dowd's book, Sea Kayaking, isn't he in a klepper? And um, yeah, he's in a klepper. He's uh, he's sailing around the Caribbean. He was also a resident of the Pacific Northwest. Oh, okay. And he knew damn well that the water was cold up there. Yeah. He advised sitting on your wetsuit, and then if you capsized, try to get into it and mm -hmm. fire off your flare. Okay. Flare. <laughs> Um, you know, which was really... I wonder how hard uh, that would be. Well, it'd be damn hard, very hard. And the other part about it is you'd have to take your PFD off if you were wearing a PFD in order to put the wetsuit on. And that, that does not work out very well at all. Because then you got, you're trying to struggle into this thing, get no flotation. And at the same time, you are completely uh, incapacitated by cold. And this was one thing I don't think Dowd appreciated. I don't think Hutchison appreciated um, at, at the time. I don't think they knew much about what happens to you when you fall in, into cold water. I think they they knew about hypothermia and passing, and that's about it. The thing that I fault people like Dowd for, and, and in fact, many of these guys on the West Coast who were manufacturers of kayaks, they didn't want to hear that cold water was dangerous. They thought it was going to hurt business. And they were pretty much impervious to reason. Hmm. So you just sit down there and you lay it all out in front of them and they just, you know, they just turn you off. I've had many, many conversations at Symposia with, with these guys, all the big names, the manufacturers on the West Coast, and absolutely nothing. They were never supportive of the, the idea of educating people about cold water safety. They diminished the danger, and they came up with 
an alternative idea, which was, oh, you know, you don't need this unless perhaps you plan on encountering quote unquote challenging conditions. Okay. And in that case, you know, okay, yeah, you might want to consider a wetsuit. The problem with that, of course, is that nobody plans on dying. Nobody plans on capsizing. Nobody plans on getting into trouble. It's not easy to dismantle that argument as having no merit, but that doesn't matter. It's still around, and it's still a thorn in my side trying to educate people. I think really that uh, starting in the 80s, since I knew about hypothermia, and I also, having done the research, I was very familiar. The British kind of pioneered this research into cold water, uh, a lot of it. And I was familiar with all of their research. And it was apparent at the time that cold shock was the significant danger and that hypothermia was actually sort of a tertiary issue. You know, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for hypothermia to develop in an average person, even in very cold water, because your, your body mounts a very vigorous defense against that heat loss. And it can take even longer if you happen to be fat, because fat is a marvelous insulator against cold water. This is, look at a walrus, you know, look at uh, seals, look at any of these aquatic mammals. And what you see is a, somebody with the same physiology that we have, except they're surrounded by a layer of fat. We call it blubber, but it's fat. When uh, you would confront people like Dowd and Hutchinson yeah. about what the research showed, what was the data that you would provide for them? At that time, there was uh, quite a bit of, of human subject research uh, that had been done, uh, particularly in Great Britain. It's the usual thing, you know, at universities, they get a bunch of grad students mm -hmm. <laughs> as their subjects from the physiology department, and off they go, and they've got pools cooled to the proper temperature, and they're measuring respiration, and they're measuring blood flow, and they're doing all sorts of stuff. But it was real apparent at the time that this was dangerous, that sudden, a sudden unprotected immersion in cold water was a life-threatening event. And that realization uh, was growing, and more and more people were looking into it, more research was being done. So there was more than enough out there at the time that anyone with an open mind could have looked at it and said, well, yeah, this makes sense. Besides, it's science. It's not like I'm coming around and I'm going, well, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion was that you should wear thermal protection. But cold shock was not my personal opinion. That was settled science at the time. Okay. Um, not as widely recognized. For example, the Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard recognized that there was something going on when people capsized, let's say, a canoe in cold water, and they just never resurfaced. Hmm. It happened often enough that they coined a special term for it, which is sudden disappearance syndrome. And I don't know if you... If you run into this a lot, but in medicine, now if you have a syndrome, it means that there's something going on, but you're not really exactly sure. sure. What it is, <laughs> you know? So it was sudden disappearance syndrome because suddenly they disappeared, and you you interview the people who were with them, or people who saw it happen, and they would go, "Well, I don't know. They fell in. They suddenly disappeared." Wow. And it was not until later that they made this connection with the fact that if you capsize in cold water, you have no protection, you're not wearing a PFD, and you gasp, which you're very likely to do when your mouth is underwater, uh, that gasp is huge. It's a, if it's above the water level, this is a full lung inflation. It's like you take in as much air as fast as you can, full lung inflation. And if your mouth is underwater when you do that, you, you drown. It's not like you might drown, maybe you can, no, you drown and you go straight to the bottom. Oh my God. So that's, that's kind of the first, the first thing that can happen to you, let's say, in a cold water immersion. And if you contrast that with the 20 or 30 minutes that it takes to develop hypothermia, 
then it becomes real apparent that you're dealing with something that is immediate. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the danger doesn't get mitigated by the fact that you have practiced doing a rescue. The hazard's still there. And today, let's if, if you switch it over to whitewater, uh, there's a phenomenon in the whitewater called flush drowning. And it's where a person's out of the boat, they haven't rolled, they bail out, they're getting flushed down the river through rapids, and they're trying to swim. And in that situation, I think that cold shock is still, in the whitewater community, an underappreciated hazard, which I'm doing my best to change. I think in academic researchers who have looked at flush drownings, I think there's an under underappreciation there as well, although I do think that's going to change in the next maybe three or five years as they become more aware of that cold shock connection. Okay. So you think that flush drowning is related to cold shock? Yes, it, it is. And, and the thing, here's the thing to understand about cold shock. Okay. If you had to characterize it just in one little short sentence, it would be that cold shock results in a complete loss of breathing control. So you completely lose control of your breathing. You're gasping, and these are huge gasps. There may be two or three of them in a row. That's followed immediately by hyperventilation, which is your breathing's out of control. You're breathing in and out as fast as you possibly can. Now, at the same time, you have this feeling that you can't get enough air. So that drives the hyperventilation. On top of that, your ability to hold your breath is dramatically reduced. Mm -hmm. So you're being flushed downriver, you've got a PFD on, you're going through rapids, and your head is being periodically submerged because they're rapids. That's a scenario in which you're very likely to drown. Mm -hmm. If you don't have control of your breathing and you're in rough water, the chance of water inhalation and drowning or near drowning is dramatically increased. The other thing about it is that since you don't have control of your breathing, swimming failure occurs. Because if you cannot coordinate, if your breathing's out of control and you cannot coordinate the swim strokes with your breathing, it becomes very difficult to swim. If you're not wearing a PFD, the second you can't swim, you're done. Mm -hmm. if there's something, you know, unless you find something to hold on to for flotation, you are done. You're going to drown. And, you know, we've got plenty of statistics on this that people who are considered to be good swimmers drown. Uh, when they're within six to 10 feet of safety because they cannot swim that distance without drowning in order to save their own lives. People who are, you know, considered by their friends and families to be quote unquote good swimmers, whatever that means, but they can swim, but not enough to overcome that. And so when you look at the gasping and the hyperventilation and the fact that you can't control your breathing and you can't hold your breath worth a damn, and you're experiencing swimming failure. And, you know, let's say at a water temperature below 45, the water is so cold that it feels like it's burning your skin. So it's a terrifying, absolutely terrifying experience. And it will, honestly, it will rattle your cage like, you know, we're talking people... People can't look at their kayaks without experiencing anxiety, sometimes for months hmm. after that occurs. Oh, Craigslist, kayak for sale happens plenty for the survivors. It's, uh, it's not an inconsequential experience. It is perhaps one of the most profound shocks, physiological shocks that your body can experience. And so that's I think the other part about it that Dowd and the rest of them didn't appreciate, because they really didn't understand it, maybe they didn't want to understand it, was the fact that 
temperatures don't have to be what we would consider that low in order for cold shock to occur. So for example, the reason we say below 70 Fahrenheit water temperature, you should be wearing a wetsuit or dry suit is because from human subject research, we know that most people, if they're immersed in cold water below, let's say between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which, you know, if you talk to somebody, say 55 degrees, they think about 55 degree air. And so they don't think it's that cold. It isn't air wise, but in water, it's brutally cold. And so between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to experience maximum intensity cold shock, gasping, hyperventilating as hard and fast as you can. You cannot control it. It reaches its maximum. If you go lower, it doesn't get any worse, then, right? That's exactly right. It doesn't get any worse because it, it can't. It's already at its maximum level of wow. between 50 and 60 degrees. What happens is the temperature gets lower is that the experience becomes more painful. Hmm. And then you also become incapacitated more quickly. You can lose the use of your hands more quickly, that kind of thing. But the actual cold shock response itself isn't any more severe at 40 than it is, let's say, at 53 or 55 or whatever. Does that require immersion of the face at all? Or, um, no, no. No, no uh, you know, some people splash cold water on their face, you know, uh, when they're getting started kayaking and so forth. There's not enough, uh, not enough research to indicate whether that's, whether that's of any value. Hmm. Cold shock is triggered when cold water contacts a large enough uh, area of your skin surface. So, for example, your chest, you can't get it just by sticking your head in the water or sticking your hands in the water or something like that. Okay. It has to be a sufficient, because it's, it's a uh, nerves responding to the cold, send this lightning bolt sized signal to your brain, which immediately initiates this response. Have you ever experienced it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like deliberately? <laughs> Deliberately, yeah. Back in the back in the day, you know, when I was in my twenties, thirties, okay. you know, I would, I would do that. I do, I would never, I would never do it now because it places a tremendous strain on your heart and blood vessels. So, for somebody seventy-four years old, I'm not looking to have a giant instantaneous spike in my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that I think is, you know, something best yeah. avoided. But, well, isn't uh, there that practice of um, going into sauna and, you know, oh, sitting sure. there as long as you can stand and then oh, jumping into sure. a cold pool? Oh, sure. Exactly. But there, what you've got is you're warm and the skin is warm. You don't see these people just frolicking around. Most of them are jumping in and getting back out yeah. pretty quickly. But you have this kind of reservoir of heat, if you will, mm -hmm. I think, and, and that, that uh, pre prevents that from happening. But the other thing that sometimes can confuse the picture is that it's possible to adjust to the cold water so that cold shock is either dramatically reduced or eliminated. And you can do this by several three to five minute immersions in cold water over the course of a couple of weeks. And, uh, oh, okay. So you can you know, train yourself it, to adapt. Yes, you absolutely, you absolutely can to reduce or eliminate cold shock. But most, it, it's a very unpleasant sensation. And certainly if you're going to do that, then the advice is, you know, wade into cold water very slowly. Okay. And gradually, and then, you know, kind of squat down and so forth, and do it where you can stand up, that kind of thing. You know, don't just jump off the side of a boat or a pier or something like that, because sudden disappearance happens a lot in those cases. So I would say, yeah, you can do it. However, most people aren't willing to do that because it is, it's quite painful and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Let's say they do go through that. Can they then just forget about a wetsuit or dry suit. And I would say, well, that's still not a good idea because the next thing that you have to worry about, and cold shock is not going to last, you know, forever. 
they'll say, well, it lasts for three to four minutes. And that's in relaxed volunteers, grad students in a lab with a professor there, and they're not scared half to death. You know, but we what we see, and we've got some examples of that on our website, and, the, you know, one fellow was hyperventilating 30, 40 minutes after he got back in his boat. Oh, wow. So... So it's not a psychological phenomenon. Well, some of it's psychological, but but a lot of it is uh, it's physiological on the front end. It can't be controlled. After a certain point, it can be, you know, you can gradually get control of your breathing. But the question is, what are the circumstances? It's the first time it happened to you, like Randy Morgart. I mean, he's he's just gotten back into his kayak with a paddle float rescue on the last try, previous attempts having failed. He knows it's his last shot. He gets back in and and, and it's kind of a half-assed get back in because he's got something under his, between his butt and the seat. He's a little high and kayak's unstable and there's water in the rear hatch and he's paddling back to the, to the put-in. Well, put yourself in his shoes psychologically i mean he could barely think straight hmm. when he finally got to the got to the takeout and he's he, he's he's out of the kayak and he's on shore he is he is so rattled psychologically that he's just making all sorts of mistakes you know he starts the car turns the blower on doesn't turn on the heat <laughs> just like, you know, i mean you know so I, i'm just saying it's this is a this is an extraordinarily big jolt to you physically and mentally, and, and that has to be appreciated. Now, back in the day, 84, most of us had never seen a dry suit, so it was wetsuits. I have a wetsuit. It's a 7 mil Farmer John covered by a 7 mil long sleeve shorty. That's 14 millimeters of neoprene over my core. And I can tell you, back when I was in my 30s, that wasn't a problem. But I think it would be bloody exhausting. <laughs> Try, boing, boing. <laughs> Trying to paddle in that thing. Yeah. But if we were going to paddle in winter and the water temperature is 35 degrees in the Potomac River, the Chesapeake Bay or whatever, that's what you need. It was like that or else the sensible thing would be just to park the kayak and don't paddle during the winter, pick it up, you know, when the water warms back up, wherever it happens to be. You can wear a two mil wetsuit, and if it's snug, it's going to prevent cold shock. It's not going to delay incapacitation that long, but it will prevent cold shock because it prevents the water from getting right next to your skin. So there are nuances to this that I think people don't necessarily understand. We go over all of that stuff on our website in the gear section and in the cold shock and incapacitation section. You know, it's a it's a very robust website. If anybody wants to to go there and dig deep, you will come away knowing a lot about this. Yeah, I found it extremely informative. And um, I especially like the case index where you yeah. have examples of uh, all these case histories yeah. Real life examples of uh, close calls and fatalities. I think those really drive the point home. And, and I, I completely redid the website a year ago. And God, that was a lot of work. I could have written three books. <laughs> I die, Mike. But I like the new platform in the sense that it enabled me to put a case index like that, where you can find the cases at the end of each one of the golden rules. We've got five golden rules for cold water safety at the end of each one of those golden rule section, you know, are some cases, but you can find them all together in the case index. And there's also a video uh, index and there's a, an index of articles. Those three things, I think, make it, it much easier to navigate, let's say, than the, than the old website. Well, now that you mentioned the five golden rules, could you uh, elaborate on those? Sure. And they're practical. When I was thinking about this, I thought, well, what can we what can we tell people? And, and you know, you could come up with three golden rules, I suppose, or six golden rules, or whatever. I settled on five because those were the five most important things. And I think it said, well, what could you do to 
give people enough information to build themselves, let's say, a pretty good safety net for cold water kayaking. So the first one, of course, is always wear your PFD. And what we mean by that is not just stick it under your bungee cords, but wear it, make sure it's properly sized, make sure it's properly fitted so that it works when you're actually in the water. Because without the PFD, as Chuck Sutherland used to say, you don't stand a chance. You really don't. You're not going to be swimming for sure or whatever. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one is always dress for the water temperature. And that means wetsuit or dry suit or some combi hybrid combination of that. Yes. And then um, there is uh, field test your gear and swim test your gear. And the difference between those two field test just means you get a new piece of gear or you're going out uh, in, in, in colder water for the first time, you need to check that gear out and make sure you know how it works. You know, if you're wearing pogies, and, and you're going to find out very, very quickly that when you pull your hands out of the pogies to do a rescue, you have nothing for protection. And so you can lose the use of your hands very quickly while you're still toasty warm in your dry suit. And if you can't use your hands, you're not in a very good situation. So field test your gear. Our point here is that all of this stuff should properly be viewed as survival gear. Because in a cold water capsize, your life is going to definitely depend on it. So you better know how it works. You better make sure that it works properly. If there are any flaws in the system, those are going to become apparent during your field testing. Where should you field test? Someplace safe, you know, preferably with some buddies, you know, a little cove or something where you, you know, you can get to shore quickly and somebody's there, you know. I got a great letter from a guy who wore his toaster mitts for the first time and he, um, he couldn't feel his grab loop when he's upside down. And uh, he finally had the presence of mind to hook his thumb into the grab loop. Hmm. He, he found it enough to hook his thumb into it because he couldn't he couldn't grasp it well enough with the uh, neoprene mittens, oh, wow. and he popped the skirt. And boy, he's on a mission to tell people about that, as you can, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> wow. So that's field testing. The other part is swim testing, and that just means you know you get to the put in, uh, wade out into the water, and make sure that uh, you don't have too much air in the suit. You haven't burped it so much that you've squashed your insulation. And if you do that at the beginning of the, let's say, the off season, if you swim test, you just go in, you know, wade into the water and squat down, swim around a little tiny bit, you're going to get a very good sense as to whether or not you have enough insulation underneath that dry suit or whether or not the, the wetsuit fits right or if, if it's going to work. You're going to get some immediate feedback. If you take the temperature of the water at the same time, look at the thermometer, that reinforces it in your brain. And... If you do that consistently, then by the time the spring rolls around, you're going to have a damn good sense of, let's say somebody says, well, water temperature is 45. You're going to know what to wear because you practiced it. George Gronseth of Kayak Academy would, every year he would have people come in uh, the middle of the winter. Yeah, and January 1st, I think. Yo, was it? Yeah, we'd yeah. Uh, sit in uh, Lake Sammamish and, and see how long they could float in the water with their dry suits I think. I think that was a wonderful thing that George did, a huge contribution because I was on the East Coast at the time, didn't attend. But um, from what I hear, and in my experience with these kind of, of tests, people really underestimate how long they're going to be able to stay in. And they come back out of the water, you know, <laughs> convinced that they need to do a little more homework. Oh, yeah. And a little more practice because they just think, oh, you know, it's going to work. And they're, they're in there and they're freezing very quickly, become very cold and they're surprised. And I think that's good because that is a practical exercise that injects reality into the system because we are excellent at, at fooling ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> rationalize, justify, you know, tell, tell ourselves stories that are just, you know, even wearing a dry suit and a reasonable amount of insulation, yeah. Uh, how long? How long could you be in cold water? Um, no, but nobody knows because that's uh, going to depend. Number one, on if you're a tall, thin person, it's going to be less than if you're a person with a lot of body fat. 
So that's inside the dry suit or just in the water without the dry suit. That's one of the variables that makes it hard to generalize. The other one is how much insulation you're going to wear underneath the dry suit and whether or not you have burped the dry suit to get the excess air out and you burped it so much that you look like a shrink-wrapped hot dog. When that suit shrinks down, it squashes the insulation underneath. And there's an old adage in wilderness travel about keeping warm, and that is that in terms of insulation, thickness equals warmth. So if you squash that thickness, you're not going to last as long. But this is why we say you need to go out there and field test your deer and swim test your deer, because you need to know, not from some generalized table, but you need to know from direct personal experience how long you can stay out and whether or not your gear works and whether or not your gloves are sufficient and whether or not you left the relief zipper open, which is something that swim testing reveals to you at a high rate of speed. And believe me, I've done it. <laughs> uh, there's that zipper little open. last, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a little last notch, you know, on the, and if you just don't, you know, if you're like, you can't see down there, the PFD is in the way, you know, you're like going on faith. And yeah. You don't quite get it all the way closed and you wait in this, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it happens after you've stopped on the beach for a bathroom break. Yeah, exactly. Oh, the final golden rule is uh, try to figure out the worst thing that could happen, all the bad things that could happen and prepare for them. And we give you a whole list of things that have happened to help prime the pump because I think people that don't have a lot of experience or haven't read a lot of accident reports, which is most kayakers, they have trouble imagining all the things that can possibly go wrong on you in a simple outing. And so that's the five golden rules. And we sort of feel that if you pay attention to those, you know, you're going to, you're going to be in a lot better position to be safe out on cold water. Now we didn't, uh, we talked about cold shock, but we didn't talk too much about the next stage, which would be hypothermia. Well, you got incapacitation okay. in, in between them. So cold shock, let's say cold shock, uh, you know, is diminishing or it's over. The second you get in the water, even while cold shock is going on, you're losing heat. And so the question is, how long is it going to take before your muscles become too cold to function and your nerves become too cold to fire those muscles? Cold water drowning tends to occur in two places in this whole picture. First, in cold shock because you're completely lost control of your breathing. And if your mouth is underwater, of course, you know, you inhale water and drown. Okay, that's one. The other is when you become so cold that you can no longer function. And that's that's true of, of swimming failure also. So swimming failure can occur in the cold shock phase. It can also occur in the incapacitation phase where your arms and legs become so cold that you know, you just simply can't swim anymore. Okay. That's something to be concerned about. And how long that takes depends, again, on how much insulation you've got, how much body fat. I do think that one thing that's underappreciated is the fact that you can lose the use of your hands in minutes while you're still toasty warm inside your dry suit. So the hmm. hand protection is very important, I think. Um, head protection is also very important incapacitation is a gradual thing. At first, you're cold, you become weak, then you become weaker, and finally, you can't function at all. And when I say you can't function at all, I mean you're hanging in the water, in your life jacket, and you are helpless. You can't move your arms and legs. Now, in rough water, uh, especially when waves are coming at you from a certain direction, the waves have a turning force on your body. And so, you will naturally be turned until you're facing the waves. Now, at that point, they're hitting you and they're going up into your face. Not a good thing. You automatically hold your breath if you're hit from behind by a wave, but trying to synchronize your your breathing in rough water to this wave splash is something that is very difficult to do over time. And so, This is a slow, nasty, incremental process uh, by which you inhale a little bit of water here, a little bit of water there, and eventually your 
lungs are so waterlogged that you drown. One of, I think, perhaps the most unpleasant ways to die that I, I can think of in a natural environment. So that's that part of it, which I think, again, I don't think people have a very great appreciation of. But hypothermia, that happens when your body cools enough so that your core temperature begins to drop. Core temperature, think of it as almost 100 degrees. It's 99.6. Average oral temperature is 98.6. Core temperature is generally a degree higher. And because the British started the research, they defined clinical hypothermia as anything below 95 core temperature. So from a medical standpoint, if a doctor says, well, the person was hypothermic, the definition there is that they had to be below 95. But by the time you get to 95, you're going to be in pretty bad shape. And if you think about, you know, moving down from 95, by the time you get to 85, which is only a 10 degree difference, your heart becomes very vulnerable to uh, abnormal heartbeats, abnormal rhythms. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very dangerous, very dangerous situation. It's all sorts of complications in terms of the difficulty of rewarming people and on and on and on. From a practical standpoint, uh, what I uh, say to kayakers is, if you're out kayaking with a bunch of your mates, the first question I ask in the wintertime is, is everybody's hands and feet warm? Your hands and feet warm? If not, says to me that their body is not producing enough heat. Because the first thing that your body does, if this is an automatic process, it reduces circulation to the hands and feet, the arms and legs. And the hands, if you look at them, they are a little bit of palm and a whole bunch of small diameter cylinders, which have a high surface area from which you can lose heat. So they're very hard to keep warm. They're at the tail end of the pipeline. The only thing that keeps them warm is blood flowing from the warmer core area out to the hands and down to the feet. And if you are having difficulty keeping yourself warm, the body automatically reduces that flow of warm blood. So, you know, you're working against yourself there. I always say hands and feet warm if they are fine. Some people say, uh, oh, you know, you can't wear uh, wetsuits or dry suits when the air temperature is high and the water temperature is cold um, because of a danger of overheating. And I would say, no, that's not that's not the case at all. You can finesse this. We've got a whole section on the website, how to avoid overheating, which mm -hmm. is, you know, my other area of expertise, you know, heat stress. So how do you keep your cool in the heat? Very simple. You use evaporation uh, to cool yourself. And it's, it takes a little bit of practice. Rolling is really good for keeping cool, too. Absolutely. It's wonderful for it. My kayak partner, Brian Price, used to call that rotary cooling. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. It's, it's absolutely great. And the other thing is you can take some very practical steps. For example, if I'm paddling along and I'm, I'm getting a little too warm, but I don't uh, necessarily want to roll to keep cool because maybe, I don't know, there's, the, the water isn't very pretty or whatever. What I can do is I can reach up and I can grab the hood of my, uh, my wetsuit, my neoprene hood, and just pull it back off my head and splash some water on top of my hair. You can be very active or participatory, if you will, in, in making these adjustments to your level of comfort. And since you're surrounded by warm water, it's quite easy to do. You know, it's a good time for rescue practice. Okay, well, let's just pause here for a second. People are getting too warm. Let's hop out of the boats or let's pull ashore and wade into the water, and, you know, lie around for three or four minutes. It's not like it's going to take a huge amount of time off of the outing. It's a habit of mind that you say, well, I'm, I'm a little too warm. I'm dressed for the water temperature, but I'm a little too warm because now all of a sudden the sun came out from behind the clouds. So what am I going to do about that in order to reduce that feeling of being too warm? And it's easy to do if you practice it. And we really give you a, a beautiful roadmap on the website for how to accomplish that. Back to 
hypothermia, what are the most effective rewarming strategies? Well, the first thing I would say is hypothermia is a hell of a lot easier to prevent than it is to treat in the field. Because what are you going to do? You'd say, well, oh, a person is too cold. You know, we're going to take them under tow. Well, if you take them under tow, they damn well better keep paddling. Because the minute they stop paddling, all of a sudden you got a drop in heat production. And they're going to get even colder. In wilderness first responders, EMT courses and stuff, what I would say to people is, let's say it's a scenario, you're on shore, here comes somebody paddling in and they, they're supposedly hypothermic or they're chilled or they're shivering or whatever. But they're, you know, coherent. They're just really cold. Shivering is an early warning sign. It occurs before, long before hypothermia develops. So if anybody is shivering, that's a red flag. So I would say you've got a couple of choices there. You know, you keep paddling or else you pull ashore and put more warm clothes on them. You, you troubleshoot the problem. And maybe it's that, uh, you know, their outer layer is too wet. You need to slip a garbage bag over them with a couple of holes for arms and then get back on the water and keep paddling. And, you know, because you want to cut down on that evaporative heat loss. In that scenario where people are coming to shore, somebody's paddling shore, they're shivering. I get them out of the kayak and I'd immediately start them walking. I don't want to put them down on a pad. If they can make sense and they're simply cold, then I want to get heat production going. Okay. I want to I want to jump start the furnace. I want to turn up the thermostat. Now, if they've got wet clothes on and you can replace those with dry clothes quickly and then slap a garbage bag on them or whatever to cut down on wind chill and so forth, go ahead and do that real fast and then get them walking because they are going to warm up. But if it's gone far enough that you're dealing with a, with an actual hypothermia situation, then, you know, you're talking about a bivouac. That means what are you going to do? It's, it's extraordinarily difficult to handle that in the field. Now, let's say you get camping gear and so forth and pull out. You can't just lay them down on the ground. They're going to lose more heat to the ground. So you've got to have an insulating pad underneath them. Got to get them out of their, their wet clothes. You know, you got to do the best you can to reduce heat loss by conduction, convection, radiation, evaporation. There are only a certain number of ways that the body loses heat, and you've got to address every single one of them. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, there are a lot of these scenarios. People want to learn all about how to treat hypothermia. They're trying to get them to memorize the umbles and the mumbles, stumbles, stuff. I'm just thinking, that's fine. But wouldn't it be nice if we could prevent that from happening in the first place? Yeah. So a lot of my career in the wilderness, when I was in Washington, D.C., running national heat stress programs, it was prevention. Recognizing early warning signs and prevention. Because none of these things are easy to deal with once they get... Once the person gets hypothermic, I mean, man, trying to deal with that in the field, you got everybody else, you know, let's say it's wind's blowing and it's raining. Mm -hmm. You're trying to deal with this person, what everybody else doing? Everybody else is standing around unless they're helping. Well, they're standing around. They're not paddling. They're not producing heat. And so, you know, it's, <laughs> you can get into a situation where the entire scenario goes into a downward spiral because you don't have enough gear hmm. to protect the whole group. You don't have enough gear to, to rewarm the person. It's, it's a mess. Well, um, mess. my, uh, my sea kayaking coaches up in, uh, San Juan islands, they would go through these exercises on treating people for hypothermia. Yeah. So they would pull up on a beach and this was out on the coast and they yeah. would say, this is a snap quiz or a test. Let's say your, your paddle is your hypothermic partner, and now you need to treat them for hypothermia. So what do you do? So everybody would get to action. They would get out their sleeping bag, and they would you know, take off the wet clothes and put their, their paddle in the sleeping bag and with, with extra warm clothes. And uh, while they would do this, all of a sudden, a wave would, show, would uh, crash on the shore and get everybody wet. Because they forgot right. to uh, move them off of the beach. Well, you know, that's a, that's a good scenario. And it's, uh, 
it's realistic because you know we're used to having a, an environment where we're pretty much in control and wilderness is not that environment in wilderness really does and and i would care you know you might say well the beach isn't necessarily wilderness well it could be or it couldn't be but the fact is if you don't have a house that you can run to to get shelter might as well be those kind of exercises i think are really good and they inject reality into it but i think it also demonstrates that if the person that's paddling with you is hypothermic when they get to the beach mistakes have been made big mistakes not to to nip that in the bud when they were simply cold when they started to shiver when they continued to shiver these are these are all preventable mistakes and so that's i think the role of education is to say hey everybody hands and feet are, everybody's hands and feet warm key question i ask it a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's my it's my way of gauging, you know, whether or not everybody's comfortable. And again, that's kind of back to my mantra of wilderness education, which is safety and comfort. What about the idea of getting in the sleeping bag with a hypothermic person with their clothes off? Well, I think it's an, it's an amusing idea. But, you know, I'll tell you what, we've tried it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was wondering because I, I, I heard there's a risk of getting hypothermic well, I think if you if you have, let's say you have, uh, even with two mummy bags that you can zip together because they're designed for that, it's still going to be difficult. I mean, if you picture it, what is the scenario? Are they inside a tent? You know, are they out on the ground? Do you have insulating pads underneath? What's the weather like? My feeling is that if you're going to go down the sleeping bag route, than putting the person in the sleeping bag naked. No, you know, get them out of their wet clothes, get them into dry clothes as fast as you can, put them in a dry sleeping bag. And if you can, crank up your little stove, make sure there's an insulating pan underneath them. If there's any way you can help to shield them from the wind or something, if you've got a bivy sack you can put over the bag, that's good. But then, you know, you, you crank up the little stove and you make yourself some hot water, put it in water bottles, make sure that damn lids are cranked on tight. Mm -hmm. Put them down into socks, some spare socks, and then stick them down in the sleeping bag. Okay. Good places for that would be the sides of the chest, like, you know, right there nestled under their arms or the groin area because there, there are a lot of blood vessels very close to the surface there, so you can help to warm them up. If the temperature is below freezing, I think, you know, you have to worry about somebody in a sleeping bag getting frostbite just because in a hypothermia situation, if you think back and you say, well, the, the circulation to the feet has been reduced, it is possible for your toes to start to freeze if they're not warm enough, depending on the outdoor environment and the size of the sleeping bag. I prefer that method uh, to this two person in the bag thing because first of all it's not going to happen in a regular sleeping i mean a regular sleeping bag you know like one of these camping sleeping bags is just a rectangle with a big opening at the top well gee whiz you want as little movement in there as possible because it flushes the heat in and out so and, and a mummy bag you're not getting two people in a mummy bag and getting the things zipped close so it's not practical and and why are they naked? You know, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's just, well, because the skin-to-skin -skin contact is going to, you know, no. You know, because this is like, oh, okay, it's going to promote heat transfer. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I'm looking at is I think it's going to expose both people to an environment in which they both have, now have trouble keeping warm. Yeah. So I wouldn't advise it is my point, I guess. Well, it makes for some amusing um, campfire conversations. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the butt of many a joke, but, you know, we tend to make jokes about things that are horrific in order to, to cope with them psychologically, I think. So, yep. you know, that's where some of that comes from. It's not, not mean-spirited, you know. It's just that people in search and rescue are notorious for the occasional morbid joke just because their job and body recoveries is so horrendous. Yeah, you see that a lot in, in the medical field as well. 
yeah, it's not that they're mean. It's not that they don't care. It's just that they have to have some way to, to cope with it psychologically. And that humor tends to be a diffuser of yeah. that, that sort of tension. Yep. Okay. Well, um, lastly, you want to talk about the National Center for Cold Water Safety and your mission to spread the word on uh, cold water safety? Sure. I'd love to. Love to. Well, first, I'd say um, we're a nonprofit organization and we don't accept advertising. Uh, if you go to the website, it's free. You don't have to register. We don't ask for your email address. We don't have cookies because we want a seamless experience. If you go and look at one of our videos, you'll find it's perched on Vimeo and we don't use YouTube because we don't like ads. We don't like somebody serving up an ad for, I don't know, whatever skittles candy bars you know right in the middle of what we think is a life death subject so the center is 11 years old and like i say with the new website i think it's, it's very robust and i think we've gone from a point where there was no good resource on the internet on this subject there was really nothing that was worth two cents We've gone from that to the point where we're an internationally respected source of information that people can rely on and that they can go to uh, to learn about this. And it's very practical. So I'm, I'm real happy with that. I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a testimony to, to all the good people who, who helped to, uh, to get this off the ground in the beginning and who have kept it going and who continue to spread the message. So there's a story on the website. I, I won't get into it in great detail, but it's uh, sort of like, why did you decide to start the center? You know, I'd been running point on the issue for quite some time, but you know, as I say, I took some time off to raise my daughters and came back uh, into it. And there was an incident in uh, Casco Bay on the coast of Maine two young women, just about the same age when they died as my daughters. And um, they got blown offshore and capsized and they died. Hmm. And that incident just shook me like a rag doll. Perhaps uh, some of it had to do with the fact that they were roughly the same age as my daughters. But it was just a horrific situation. And I thought, can I walk away from this? knowing what I know, you know, given my past involvement with the subject and so forth. And I didn't think I could. And so I decided, well, I do know something about how to start an organization. And, you know, we've got this internet, you know, and I think we can do something here. So I, I made that decision. And uh, here we are 11 years later. It's a good incident uh, in its own right. Uh, it's worth it's worth reading, but it also, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in how an event can change the course or trajectory of somebody's life, that's a pretty good example. <laughs> so yeah. I, I wasn't planning on it, but, you know, after that happened, I went online and I looked around and I said, what kind of information is out there? And it was a surprise to me that there was nothing that was accurate, nothing that was that was good, nothing that really put this whole thing about cold shock together and tied it, tied it to it. It was just nothing at all. And I just, I thought, well, I'm going to change that <laughs> <laughs> in my usual exuberant way, you know, not, and I think it's a blessing sometimes that you don't really envision, you know, when you've got fire in the belly and you're getting ready to, start something new you know you don't you, you kind of underestimate the hurdles yeah <laughs> i sure as hell did but you know again uh there was a whole group of people um and and it was uh a lot of them with the chesapeake paddlers association and one of their uh satellite clubs that helped and were really instrumental in, in helping me to get this going because boy it was uh, it wasn't easy to start up. I have a quote in there by Eric Soares because I was in touch with him during that period. 
Eric Soares of the Tsunami Rangers. Yeah, co-founder of the Tsunami Rangers. And he was a very strong supporter of cold water safety. In fact, when I wrote the article in 1991 uh, that Chris Cunningham published in Sea Kayaker, which was called Colchuk, the next issue, every letter to the editor was against it. Wow. Said that I was, you know, hyping. I was a fear, a fear mongering and it was unnecessary and just don't capsize and stuff. Eric Soares was the lone exception to that. Sorry, chorus. And he was in his prime. And he was a guy who was really not to be trifled with. You know, you couldn't say of Eric Soares, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> now, you couldn't say that as a sea kayaker without getting laughed out of the room. And he wrote a letter that said, a very supportive letter, but that said something to the effect that the article should be either taped or stapled to the far head of every sea kayaker. I can't remember if it was taped or stapled, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, I was I was really grateful to him for that because he had the gravitas to make people sit up and listen. And he said it was important, and it was. And so I have a quote from him on the um, one that he said shortly before he had that final, well, that aortic aneurysm killed him far too young. He said, Moulton, if you just get the ball rolling, good people will come out of the woodwork as if by magic to help make your dream come true. And he was right. And, you know, I carry that. I've carried that message in my heart for a long time now. He, he, was, a, he was a great guy. And it just reaffirms my, my faith that there are people out in the kayaking community who really do care, who are thoughtful, intelligent, and, and they... You know, they read the science and they help to pass the message along. And I think people that are at the top of the, the sport, I think, have a, an obligation to lead by example. And I think that's also true of anybody that manufactures equipment. You know, they have an obligation not to undermine cold water safety, which they frequently do um, through pictures with people paddling on ice cold water with no protection. And I think the same is true of publishing houses. Rapid Media comes to mind. They've done an awful job over the last 10 years. You know, they just constantly articles, you know. Seven most important things for winter paddling. They don't mention dry suits <laughs> or wet suits. You know, I mean, how is that? How is that even possible? So, yeah. you know, these are the things I, I think uh, we have people who are influencers, a popular new term, uh, in our sport. We pretty much can figure out who they are, and they have an obligation to do that. I was incidentally kicked off of the uh, Church of the Double-Bladed Paddle after eight years of participating. Wow. Because I went a little too far to suit the admins on recommending that they don't uh, allow photos of people paddling on cold water without PFDs. That was the last straw for them. Oh, wow. Got a letter. Well, we've been patient with you. That's the Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, the Facebook yeah. group. And, and they have, you know, 30,000, 30,000 30, members or something. But they have a history of kicking off safety advocates. I somehow thought, you know, because of what I was doing, you know, that I was somehow immune, you know, that I had sort of like a, an invisibility cloak or some sort of protective gear, you know. That would, no, boot, boot right off. Wow. You know, this is, this is the thing. If you don't support safety, what does that say about you? Paddling is a wonderful sport, but it has a very sharp and unforgiving edge when things go south. So there is a role for safety. And I think we have a long tradition, a proud tradition in paddle sports of helping to educate our fellow paddlers. And some of these admins on these Facebook groups, they have no understanding of that whatsoever. You don't have to have any qualifications to start a Facebook group at all. You know, that's a criticism. 
that I have about them because I think that with influence should come responsibility. You know, not yeah, just to go out and sing Kumbaya and say what a wonderful sport it is. It is a wonderful sport. But it's not a wonderful sport if your husband or your best friend or somebody in your, your group gets killed because of a, a mistake that was preventable, avoidable. A lot of these people never get the word. This is one reason I fault the influencers. I think they have an obligation to help spread the word. It's not a kumbaya subject, but life is like that. Life is a balance of good and bad, safe and unsafe, whatever. And I think it's best approached with eyes wide open. And if you have no idea that there's a danger, how can you protect yourself against it? You can't. Andrew, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. It really has. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for being on the Dubcast, and thanks for your contributions to the sport. And uh, for our listeners, I highly recommend Bolton's website, coldwatersafety.org. It's an amazing resource. Really eye-opening case histories to go through.